What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. Over the past few years with the releases of the more open world Pokemon games, one topic of conversation has become a lot more prominent. Are shiny Pokemon too easy to find? While the ability to encounter a large amount of Pokemon has drastically increased, I decided to put this theory to the test in the Indigo Disc DLC by seeing just how quickly you can catch 100 shiny Pokemon in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And this is how it went. Because it'd be a little monotonous just to go and catch 100 shiny Pokemon, I came up with 10 different tasks that I have to complete, which gives the opportunity to explore the entire terrarium, as well as potentially finding the best method to get as many shinies as I can. Our first stop is going to be right at the entrance with the Savannah Biome. Now, as you probably know, the terrarium is separated into four different quadrants, each with a different ecosystem to explore, and conveniently, the first 10 shinies that we need to find are right at the entrance. Although I do want to try and complete this as fast as possible, I decided to make the rule that when I'm taking on biome-specific challenges, the shinies that I find have to be split 50-50 between outbreaks and flying around. It's important to note that regardless, I'll be making shiny sandwiches to ensure that I have the highest chances, no matter what I'm doing. With the release of this DLC, there was an event outbreak from Milsery, so I decided that I should take on that first before it changes. For these special outbreaks, they have an increased 1 in 200 chance of being shiny, and it was pretty apparent that maybe this challenge would be a lot easier than I expected. That has to be shiny, right? You're kidding! It's been a minute and a half! I mean, <laughs> it's gonna be a quick video then. That is crazy. Granted, this is the only outbreak that will have this low of odds, so let's just compare this to a regular one. As you probably know, after knocking out 60 Pokemon in an outbreak, the odds increase to about 1 in 500, and because the outbreak won't disappear unless you defeat everything, you can just fly around and constantly respawn Pokemon until you get what you're looking for. I decided to give this idea a shot with Execute in the northern section of the area. Although the odds are better than just flying around, you do have to spend 8-10 to 10 minutes defeating all of them, which obviously isn't a lot of time, but across 100 Pokemon, it could take upwards of 17 hours if I chose to do it for all of them. After only 10 minutes, I managed to find my second shiny, and even this early on, I was adamant that doing outbreaks was going to be the fastest way that I could get a shiny. To balance it all out, I decided to do some flying encounters, and I had one big target in mind. With the introduction of this DLC, a bunch of Pokemon that were formerly stuck in the game since the 3DS era became catchable once again, and I wanted to get my hands on a Blitzel. Despite this game being transferable up to Ultra Sun and Moon, Blitzel has actually not been catchable since X and Y over a decade ago, and that one was exclusive to the Friend Safari, so honestly, it hasn't been around since the games it originated in. When it comes to doing the flying portions, I threw together an electric encounter shiny sandwich, which increases my chances to about 1 in 700, which sounds drastically worse than the outbreaks, but it's important to consider that 1, you can encounter a lot more Pokemon at once, and 2, if the Pokemon you're hunting is the only Pokemon to have this type in the area, you will almost exclusively see that Pokemon somewhat like a giant outbreak. Over an hour passed with multiple sandwiches and nothing appearing, but eventually, I did find a shiny. Ooh. There it is. I did want Blitzel, but I mean, I will take what I can get because it's been over an hour or so. There we go. That is three down. As you can imagine for a challenge like this, I had the game plan of finding all of these forgotten Pokemon, and I decided that from here on out, I would try to obtain as many of them as possible. After doing a bit of research, I made my way to the southwestern section of the savannah to try and hunt down Litleo. This was again a Pokemon that was last seen in the Pokepelago of all things in Ultra Sun and Moon, and with a fire sandwich, I was able to isolate it, with the exception of the Magmar line, which I was still fine with getting. Unlike the others I'd obtained so far, this one was not kind. Disregarding that it took two hours just to find something, the performance in this area is not great. After a few attempts, I was confident that I missed one just off of how many I'd seen up until that point, but eventually, I was able to get the shiny Litleo. Because the last two shinies took nearly 12 times as long as the mass outbreak ones that I caught, I decided to do another outbreak, and I came across a pretty interesting one. After farming enough blueberry points from completing tasks in the terrarium, you can unlock a feature that allows you to catch all of the starter Pokemon from past generations, which means that you can also find them in the outbreaks. Just as I expected, getting another shiny with this method wasn't going to be too hard. There it is. Nice. <gasps> no! No! <sighs> oh, that was really stupid. And I didn't save. On the upside, it only took me another 30 minutes to find another, but from this point on, I made sure to save before every shiny so I don't have to deal with this again. Back where I found Zebstrika, I rode around for 30 minutes and eventually found a shiny Sandile, to which I then realized that there was one more Pokemon in this area that I really wanted to be part of my collection. Ever since these games came out, I've always wanted to hunt Girafferig. I mean, even since the badge quest I did a year ago, but I ended up finding a Tauros instead. Despite catching an unnecessary amount of them in Platinum with a Poke Radar, I just wanted to encounter Fair Giraffe in some way, so I threw down a Psychic sandwich and started flying around. In hindsight, I probably should have made a normal one, and it was pretty obvious that this might not go in my favor. Oh, 
Okay. Now I know this may seem like it's not a good thing because I already have execute. I can evolve that execute into a lonely executor, which I also don't have. So that would be a pretty cool thing. No. All right, now it's a problem. Since by this point, I basically only walked around like two different areas of the savannah, I made my way close to the center of the terrarium to hunt down the flag online. A pretty neat aspect of this DLC is that it seems like you can encounter outbreaks for evolved Pokemon significantly more than the base game, but with a ground type sandwich, you can encounter the entire line at the area border, so really anything was cool to see. After 30 minutes pass, I was able to find a shiny trap inch, which means I only have one more Pokemon left to obtain in this area. Back in the northern area, I managed to come across a Relor outbreak, and while this is the only Gen 9 line of Pokemon in the terrarium aside from Ferragraph, I still have never obtained one, and the thought of encountering a giant rolling big nugget in the wild just seemed like a cool thing to end up with. Ignoring the fact that this took significantly longer than any other hunt I had done up until this point, I had some issues during this one. Yeah, what's up? Okay, I'll be there in a sec. No, wait, hold on, hold on. Oh, no, 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 no. All right. That's gone. Despite failing my second shiny in just the first section, I was still determined to get this done, and thankfully, after an hour and a half, I was able to get my reclaim. With the first 10 out of the way, it was time to take on something a little more interesting. As I mentioned before, all the stars are available to be caught in this game, and I'm able to freely roam the terrarium and hunt down whatever Pokemon I want. Now, although I do have 24 different options, I really wanted to aim for a few that I've always wanted to have, and I decided to start with the Grookey outbreak in the coastal biome. I ended up finding a shiny really quickly, but it was definitely not what I expected. Oh, I mean, that's not what I was looking for, but that's going to be helpful later. I didn't even think of this as a scenario. That's such a great shiny, too. Bro, shut up. Because this obviously isn't a starter, whatever Pokemon I find that doesn't match the requirements for what I'm looking for, I'll just save them for the next section where it would best fit in. A few minutes later, I ended up finding a shiny monkey, and from here, I went to the Chargestone Cave to check out a Chespin outbreak. Now, one thing I like to note about making sandwiches in this game is that it's based around the environment that you're in, as the minigame is actually done in the overworld. This means that it's taking a reflection of all the blue crystals, and it looks like you're cooking during a solar flare. Unfortunately, this is going to be super annoying when I have to be here later, but thankfully, I was able to get out of here pretty quickly. I literally just made the sandwich. You know, I'm starting to think that shiny hunting's really hard in this game. After this, I went back to the coastal biome to take on a Chikorita outbreak, which apparently is kind of rare from what I was told, but it only took me about half an hour to find my third starter. I was kind of tired of going after all these grass starters, so I moved over to the small bog area in the savanna where you can exclusively find Sobble. This was shockingly a little hard to spot out of a group of them, but I was able to find one, and then I moved over to the coastal cave to hunt down easily the best shiny starter, Mudkip. Thankfully, with a water sandwich, you can exclusively find them here, as well as opportunities for some really unique hunts, like Acrobatic Rebel Cliff Mudkip and Stuck Behind the Lantern Jail for His Multiple Felonies Mudkip. After 20 minutes, I was able to grab this, and I had a little more time on my sandwich to get one more water Pokemon. I decided to hunt down Poplio through an outbreak, which is my first encounter with hunting down something in the water. Granted, this outbreak was pretty weirdly placed, so half of the encounters were on the beach, but for a shiny like this and the way lighting works in Scarlet and Violet, this was not going to be easy. I typically look at a lot of the shinies before I hunt them them as a mental reminder, and I honestly figured that a darker blue and pink ribbon around its neck would make it stand out like crazy, but seeing as this took me over an hour to find, it's fair to say that I probably missed one. Oh, that's it. Wow, I almost passed it. Oh, it looks so good. To finish off the trios, I started working on taking on the fire starters. I did a little research and found out that Litten has an isolated hunt by where the cleaver spawns, so I spent some time hunting that down, which was insanely noticeable and technically my first canyon biome shiny if we're not counting the chestpin from Chargestone Cave. I then went to the polar biome for the first time to check out a score bunny outbreak, which took a little over 10 minutes to appear. Oh, that's it for sure. <laughs> I cannot believe how fast I'm getting these Pokemon. These little stumps in the snow. <laughs> Oh my god! Finally, I went back to the canyons to get a shiny Tepig, which left me with only one more starter. Because at this point, I had already obtained the other two Gen 7 starters, and I definitely didn't have plans of softer setting these in Ultra Moon, I went to the savannah to hunt for Rowlet. I managed to get an outbreak, and once again in 10 minutes, I found the last one. Oh, there. Wow. Mint Owl. Absolutely insane. I caught 10 shiny starters in four hours. Now, although that's impressive, I had a feeling that I could do a little bit better. The next day, I decided to stream hunting down all these shinies, and needless to say, the shinies I found were pretty unique. Oh, we found the green little. Where is he? What? No, where are you going? No, you're, I can't catch you. 
Come back! If I could rename any one Pokemon, what would I rename? I'd rename Quilladin to dead, and I'd bury him. Oh. Well, how did that happen? How do I convince Golette to show up and be shiny? Maybe if we all smile. Hey, any day now. Wait. Oh, wait, that worked. Oh. Okay, that worked. At this point, my chat noticed I had an outbreak for Minior and convinced me to give it a shot. Now, if you don't know, Minior definitely has a shiny, and honestly, it's really cool. The issue is that it's encased in a shell, which means that any one of these Minior could be shiny on the inside, and the only way to tell is to battle each and every one of them. Thankfully, you can auto-battle them, and I've had plenty of experience with this before with finding Zoroa, but I knew that it would take an insanely long time to find. Our Pokemon that are supposed to be imposters? You're playing with me! You're playing with me, Gallade! You're playing with me! <laughs> that was so fast! We're good, guys! We're good! I decided to use the remaining time on my flying sandwich to go in the nature reserve to see if I could find a Skarmory, and needless to say, I definitely found a shiny. I feel like this would be a better nighttime po- Oh my god! Oh my god! Come on down, come on down, baby! No, it's okay! It's okay, you can come down! Are you stuck? Oh, he's stuck. Are you his friend? How did he get up there? Oh, you guys can't all start talking at once. I'm trying to listen to one story at a time. You know what? Fine, I'll, I'll do it. I'll get it myself. Lazy. Oh, Belton's in the caves in the polar? Speaking of caves that are polar, one of the, the very few attractions in New Hampshire is a place called the Polar Caves. Naturally made caverns that you can walk through. Or they have two final ones. They have one that's the, it's called the Lemon. I was trying to tell a story. Can I finish the story without finding a shiny? New test. The final ones though, they have two. The Orange Crush and the other one's called the Lemon Squeeze. I went in there. They had to shut down the end of it in the nicest way. Um, there was a very large woman who decided that she was bold enough to go through the Lemon Squeeze and she got stuck and they had to call the fire department. And so they had to like push everybody out. What is I need to tell this story? Where are all these shinies coming from? I can't finish this story. This is the most Crazy collection of monsters! Thankfully, they're all different. And also, I'd like to note, I found all the flying types except for the one I came for. When I finished upstream, I only had three more Pokemon to catch in this area, and I started out by grabbing a Magneton in the Charge Stone Cave, and then decided to go for yet another starter. At the bottom of the canyon with a water sandwich, you're able to find Outbreaks of Squirtle, and initially, because it looks like it's set in the marsh area, it seems like an easy hunt. Unfortunately, even with a water sandwich, they mostly spawn in the water, and just like the Poplio hunt, finding shiny encounters in the water is not an easy task. Oh my god, I knew it. I had it. I sensed it. I was like, there. I knew that this was shiny, dude. What in the world? <laughs> I cannot believe I spotted that. After getting this, I decided to give up on Squirtle because of how few spawns I was actually getting, and decided to head back to the nature reserve to try and find something in the Sinchino outbreak. When it comes to some outbreaks, they're really oddly placed, as this one is placed basically on the river, and although it would be kind of morbid for them to infinitely spawn on the river, it does cut off the amount of spawns. I decided to use a normal type sandwich and hunt down the final member of this section. Uh, no. I had a feeling it wasn't gonna be Sinchino, so, you know what? It's all good. It is a shiny nonetheless. With 30 shinies under my belt, I spun the wheel again to land on arguably the most unique challenge so far. In the League Clubhouse, you can use blueberry points to redeem the item printer, which gives you what feels like an unlimited list of items, ranging from things like Terra Shards to competitive items. However, for every time that you use it, there's a small chance you can activate a bonus, which will either double the amount of items that you receive, or enable a separate list of items that are exclusively all the variations of Pokeballs. Although you can get normal items like luxury balls, the ultra rare rewards consist of things like the Apricot corn balls, special balls like the beast ball, and even master balls. For this section, I can catch whatever I like, however all the catches need to be in these unique pokeballs, and I'll do my best to color match whatever I find. Coincidentally at this point, the Milsery outbreaks went out of rotation in exchange for a short weekend of Delibird outbreaks with the same boosted odds. To no surprise, this was extremely easy to spot, and I used a love ball to start my collection. The next Pokemon I obtained, however, is something that I've been waiting for. Now although I had already taken on the starter section, there were a couple that evaded me, most notably the Johto starters. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that they were pretty difficult to encounter, and I'd finally obtained a Totodile outbreak. Because normally things like Dupiter and Bruxish could spawn here in the savannah, Totodile isn't prioritized at all, but now I have an entire pond dedicated, so I got to the grind. Oh, there it is. Saw that from a mile away. This is by far my most favorite shiny in this DLC for sure. Also, wow, I didn't even notice that. I got a female one too? What are the odds of that? 
Yes, sir. All right. I'm so glad I got that. At this point, the challenge was creeping up on Christmas time, so I decided to stop and just sit back, relax, and enjoy the finer things of my family. Like building an entire backpack setup so I could record my shiny hunts on the plane. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I looked completely insane putting everything together on the plane. Definitely not suspicious at all. And you're probably thinking, this is a bit overkill when you could just use the screenshot record button that was built onto the console. But one, I miss out on all of this HD quality, and I want the full proof that I'm the first and only person in the entire world to ever catch a shiny chromomitable in a sports ball 30,000 feet in the air. I also did catch a shiny Lapras, but my laptop stopped recording because of my storage, so I took a little creative liberty with this one. Oh, but. Wow, guys, I found it. All right, let me just use my heavy ball that I have in my bag. Nice, we got it, and this isn't Let's Go. After spending some time at home, I came back to take on more of this section, and the special outbreak had changed once again to Duraludon. Unlike the others, this one didn't have increased odds, but fortunately, one showed up pretty fast, and I was able to catch it in a moon ball. I decided to make my way out of the polar biome and check out more of the coastal area. I was able to catch Slowpoke, or a Choreo, a male Meow Stick when I was coincidentally hunting in a female outbreak, and a Gloom in a Safari Ball. At this point, I'd used every ball I had, excluding the Beast Ball. This is by far the hardest ball to catch Pokemon in, as its effectiveness is a tenth of a regular Pokeball when used on any Pokemon that's not an Ultra Beast. So I was gonna really need to make it count. I ended up finding a Porygon outbreak, and with the location it was placed in, they spawned more than any other one that I had taken on before. And before you know it, the final one appeared. Oh wow, there it is. Now, catching it in a Beast Ball is an entirely different scenario. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna figure it out. Wow. That's crazy. All right, well, that's the end of that. With another section completed, I was tasked on being locked to the coastal biome. Unlike what I had done so far, I actually only needed to catch nine shinies as I decided to throw in that Bellossom that I caught earlier. So I made my way to the top of the waterfall and used a fire sandwich. Although I was looking for a Numel, I ended up finding a shiny Torkoal, and with the remaining time, I encountered a Picky Pack in only 10 minutes. While it does sound quick, this was an eternity compared to what I found in the next hour. Oh, oh wow, that's... Really sick. Now, although I did just get Picky Pack, I mean, just look at it. Like that, it's just a ridiculously cool shiny. Are you kidding me? <laughs> there was literally, how long has my sandwich been active? It's been seconds. Okay, I mean, like, why not just ride out the rest of it? There, there's no other bug Pokemon that spawn in the coastlands, so I might as well just use it and see if I can get a Raquinid instead. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? This makes no sense. Oh, there it is. Oh, <laughs> there it is. Don't even need to do my, my combo. That's crazy. Oh, there it is. Wow, I thought that was gonna be hard to see, but that is very blatantly shiny. In the span of an hour, I managed to get enough to be left with only one more Pokemon for this section. And to be honest, I had basically caught everything that I wanted already, except for one Pokemon. Zangoose. This is a shiny that I've wanted ever since I saw it in Pokemon Ruby, and I figured there'd be no better time than now to get it. This one basically took as long as the past six combined did, but that didn't really mean much when this was by far the fastest section I had done so far. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's so sick. All right, I think this is probably the fastest section I've done so far. Also, I'm halfway done, so that's pretty cool. With 50 shinies collected, I reached the halfway point in a little over 27 hours, and to be honest, I don't think that's too bad. The next wheel spin landed on RNG. This quite literally is just me using a random number generator and just hunting whatever I could find, so long as I didn't already have the line, which even with 50 Pokemon is a lot oh. harder than you'd think. Originally, this was going to be Pokemon that finally returned, but by this point, I'd already caught so many of them that half of them would have been duplicates, but later on, I learned that making this change was one of the best decisions I could have made. What is number six? That has to be a joke, right? I found out that doing a rock type sandwich in the area where I found Litleo would only spawn that line. And although that basically guarantees the shiny, the lighting in this game never fails to disappoint. Oh, is that it? Oh, it is. You know what? <laughs> now, <laughs> looking back, I'm definitely blown over that. I thought it was all the same color. Oh no. So as you can imagine, the last section gave me a lot of hope that I could get through this challenge a lot faster than how long it's currently taken. And it's important to note for the most part, I've already tackled all the methods that I could do which makes it really hard to explain the rest of this section. I ended up rolling a 155 for Sandshrew, which thankfully is one of the only version exclusives in Violet for this DLC, and in seven minutes I managed to find one. This is when things got a little insane. 
There's no way. How? Who's number one in the deck? Is it Doduo? Oh, wow. That's crazy that I found. There were so many other shinies that I could have found. Once again, insane how fast these, <laughs> these encounters are. Okay, six minutes. I mean, that's really quick, but good luck happens, right? Okay. Okay. Oh! <laughs> nice. That is pretty convenient. <laughs> Oh, I haven't even started the timer. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. It's not really why I came here. But okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's try and get Inkay now. Wait, is that it? There's no way, dude. Are you kidding? <laughs> what is happening? What in the world is happening? I, I don't even know what to say. In the past 10 minutes, I've found four shinies. <laughs> okay, is that it? That's gotta be it, right? I mean, that was correct for the area. Oh, nice. Super, super noticeable. Cool. We're going for a record for this section, I swear. <laughs> Ooh, Bulbasaur. Okay. I, I do not know what's going on, but this is just so busted. I have nothing to say. So far, I was seven Pokemon in after about an hour and 20 minutes, but the next Pokemon I rolled, I knew was going to break the streak. 128. Uh, well... <laughs> There goes the fun. For a lot of reasons, Sinistee is not a fun Pokemon to hunt down, but let's start with the obvious, the size. Despite its shiny being noticeably different, that means absolutely nothing when they are this big. This is one of the largest contenders for debating the why is there no shiny sound or at least sparkles in these games, and trying to find a purple teacup when the tea part of it is already purple is nearly impossible from a distance, especially when I have a really bad eye disease called being 27. Nah, I'm just kidding. I have nystagmus, my contact prescription is negative seven in both eyes. This really blows. There is, however, one upside, a rare little guy. To the untrained eye, these may seem like the same teacup. However, this one has extra pixels. Although this outbreak is almost entirely phony sinistry, when I find the shiny, there's a one in 100 chance of it being the authentic one. While this would be cool, I knew that just seeing one would be more impressive in my head, and considering how much trouble I was already having just knocking them out, this was going to- Wait, are you- Dude, what is happening? I was so ready for them to be like, oh man, this is gonna be a tough one. <gasps> well, that wasn't very authentic of you. In total, this took 10 minutes to find, and it did end up not being authentic, but maybe I'll hunt the real one in the future. For the next shiny, I was once again sent to the coastal biome to get Froki. With the water sandwich, the land encounters will exclusively become riddled with frogs, or so I thought. Uh, it shocks me how easy they are to find because they really don't look like they would be. I mean, maybe they are just an easy shine to find. Two of the four patterns, which is pretty sick. Wait. Yep, there it is. <laughs> Almost flew right over it. That's crazy. In the span of one hour and seven minutes, I had managed to find 10 shinies. <laughs> How is that even statistically possible? For the seventh section of this challenge, I landed on the flying category. This quite literally means that I just had to fly around until I find one, which removes any use of the mass outbreaks. Now, while this does sound like a downside, nearly every shiny in the past section was found outside of outbreaks, and I was excited to see if mass outbreaks really are inferior to just roaming around. I decided to continue the water sandwich from Froki, as I had like 26 minutes left, and within three minutes, I was able to spot a shiny horsey in the water. I genuinely don't know how I spotted it, because the water encounters are insanely hard to see, but I was able to quickly catch this, as well as Chinchu a few minutes later. From here, I did a little research and realized that there were a few isolated hunts that I could go for, so I made my way back to the northernmost area of the canyon, and with a normal type sandwich, I was able to track down a shiny Smeargle. At this point, I kind of realized that only like a tenth of the total shines I caught were from the polar biome, so I threw together a fairy sandwich to try and grab a snubble, and it was very apparent that the game had been waiting for me to get there. Are you- I don't understand. I don't understand this. That is a record. That was a whopping four seconds. Genuinely. That was like four seconds. Considering I'd used quite literally one minute of my boost, I figured that attempting something else with the same typing would be a smart idea. Unfortunately, there's an insanely short list of fairies in this DLC, but as you'd expect, I was still able to get one. Oh, there it is. Wow. <laughs> 
Perfect. All right, halfway done. It dawned on me that I barely explored any areas of the charged stone cave aside from getting mini ore. So I threw together an electric encounter shiny sandwich and roamed around until I found something. Somehow, once again, I drove directly into another road, Tom, but at least I can turn it into a fridge or something. I made my way back to the savannah to catch a couple more that I had on my mind, starting with Venomoth, which still to this day is my favorite Gen 1 shiny eye of them all, but there was more important business. I had a giraffe to catch. I figured that using a psychic type sandwich would yield me pretty good results, and if I stay near the pond where I found Totodile, I can limit my encounters to only Giraffe Rig and debatably one of the Pokemon of all time. Oh, wow. You know, a lot of people say that this Pokemon's ugly, and I will confidently stand with them. With a little time left, I roam the fields for anything blue. Things like Giraffe Rig, Fairgraph, Giraffe Rig, I got an Exeggutor again. With a dream dead, I entered the Torchlight Cavern in the coastal biome to find one more Pokemon I really wanted. Magby. Now, if you've seen older videos of mine, you're probably saying, John, you have like 12 of these. Why would you want another that you're just gonna stuff in Pokemon Home? Listen, there are some shinies that I just really like to get. I am also running out of evolution lines to hunt for, so I needed something. So Pink Duck it is. With all that completed, it was time to take on the final method that I had planned. When you look at the outbreaks at face value, they're meant to be cleared out. It's just that it's significantly more convenient to shiny hunt by just respawning them. But is the intended method just as good? So for every outbreak that I do, I have to clear out the entirety of them, which is a little over 100 Pokemon, which means that I could potentially be knocking out thousands of encounters in this section. Because auto battling won't knock out any shiny encounters, I decided to track down one of the hardest shinies to see in the entire game. I ended up having a Joltik outbreak, and disregarding the lighting issues in Charged Stone Cave, this Pokemon is small. I also think the only Pokemon worse to hunt than this is Tynemo, but regardless, I would started clearing it out. Oh, I could tell. I could tell, actually. That's crazy. Oh, man, that's so, so fast, too. Although I did find this really quickly, I still had to clear out the entirety of it, and unfortunately, this was the luckiest I was going to get. I worked on clearing out any new outbreaks that I saw. Seedra, Scrafty, Sawsbuck, nothing. It took me nine completed outbreaks and two hours before I was able to get a shiny Electabuzz, which is when I realized that I'm honestly not going about this in the best way possible. See, the way that I figured that I should do it was just to move from Pokemon to Pokemon, knocking out whatever I saw, but when you consider that my best odds really only occur after I knock out 60 of the 100 encounters, it really doesn't leave a lot of potential. This is when I came up with the corralling method. By leaving my Pokemon to auto battle, I ride around within the range of my Gallade, so I'm able to respawn Pokemon all while I'm still clearing out the area. Does this increase my chances? Absolutely. But it still took another hour to find my next shiny. There it is. It was like right at the end of the outbreak too. Unfortunately, this method doesn't work everywhere because the area for the spawn sometimes isn't as large or easy to move around. So while in concept it does sound good, most shinies took between one to two hours to find. Oshawa took nearly as long as Electabuzz, and I had a nice break with Finneon and my second Relor through only a few outbreaks, but the one that followed was the worst of them all. Over the span of three hours, I completed 15 outbreaks without a single shiny Pokemon. Granted, I could have totally missed one, especially when you're dealing with things like Muck. But as always, one has to show up eventually. Oh, finally, dude. Wow, that's crazy. <sighs> with a quick Scyther encounter and even a shiny Trico in the nature preserve, I was left with only one more to find. Originally, I was a little picky with what outbreaks I cleared, but by this point, I was taking on whatever to get it over with. But even the sandwiches didn't want me to continue. Dude, oh my god. With a little glue and a lot of patience, I was able to eventually get through this area. Oh, that's gotta be the shiny, right? And that is three of the four Deerling line, which is absolutely insane. And additionally, the 10th Pokemon out of this very, very long section. With over 11 hours behind us and 80 shinies caught, it was time to take on the Polar Biome. Over the course of the challenge thus far, I'd only caught nine Pokemon in the Polar Biome, and considering by this point I basically caught nearly one of each line of Pokemon everywhere else, this location was going to be loaded with encounters. Arguably, some of the best in the game. I started by doing a Minchino outbreak, where it appeared after only seven minutes, and I decided to roam around the lower parts of the mountain with a Psychic-type sandwich to exclusively hunt the Beldum line. Because this area is pretty bland color-wise, I was really banking on the gold the accents to stand out, but the silver body was actually super noticeable. However, the next one, not so much. Because it's still over 20 minutes remaining on my boosts, I decided to hunt the only other psychic line in this area. Now, if you play Pokemon back in like Gen 5, you know that Solosis has a pretty vibrant shiny, changing from this green to a more teal looking bubble. Just like a lot of Pokemon, the transition to 3D changed a lot of the colors, and even looking at these models, you can see the differences. But when you consider the size and the area that it's in, I can guarantee that you yourself has probably failed one. Oh, is that it? There's no way this is it, right? It is. Like, look at the. 
Look at the reference. That's a normal one, and this is a shiny one? To give me a little break from the eye strain, I ventured into Charge Stone Cave to catch a shiny mine in, and decided that I wanted to take on the last outbreaks that I was forced to do. I made my way into the water to finally tackle a Pokemon that I've wanted for a long time, Hisui and Quillfish. This is one of the very few shinies in Legend Arceus, to my knowledge, that I haven't caught. To be fair, I have like 300 shinies in that game, so maybe it's somewhere deep in those boxes, but considering that it's significantly easier to evolve in this game anyways, I figure this is going to be more fun. After this, I worked on a Seal Outbreak, which surprisingly was a lot easier than you think to see, and finally a quick Piplup Outbreak finished all of what I needed here. With three shinies left, I decided that the mountain where I found Beldum was probably the best spot, as it spawned a ridiculous amount of Pokemon, and with a Grass Sandwich, I had the chance of finding a few things, most importantly, the final Deerling that I needed. I ended up finding a Snow and eventually his son, and with some time still on the clock, I quickly finished up yet another section. Uh, it... No. Well... <laughs> That's the last one. For the final section of this challenge, the goal is very simple. Catch a shiny for every color in the rainbow. Obviously, there are only seven big colors in the rainbow, but knowing my luck, I was going to get pretty unlucky. I decided to start in the savannah biome, and this is how it went. Oh, oh yeah, that's shiny. There it is, right at the end of my sandwich too, right? I mean, I guess that's yellow. Oh, wow, there it is. I almost flew right over it. I wasn't even paying attention. There it is. Oh, okay, so. This has to count as blue, right? Mm. I'm pretty sure that's shiny. And if it is, that's a terrible shiny. <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh, little purple guy. Perfect. All right, we've got three colors left. Oh, red hands. Red guy. Oh, that's definitely shiny. Um, That is not green or blue, but it's still a little guy. Oh, that's what we're looking for. Baloo, or indigo, I'm sorry, indigo. Oh, green. All right, that is the whole rainbow. With 99 shinies collected and the rainbow complete, I decided to take on arguably the hardest shiny to get in the entire DLC. Now, I know I mentioned earlier that Tynamo is the hardest shiny to get, but I meant that visually. In my opinion, there is one more shiny that is significantly harder, and that's because it's hard to spawn. In the top right of the polar biome, there's a glacier that you can enter that for some reason contains a small collection of Cyndaquil. Why are they there? No clue. But unfortunately, the spawning for this area is really bad. I threw down a fire sandwich and started riding in and out of the area, and maybe at most I would see like four at a time, but usually there would only be one, or even worse, nothing. Apparently the reasoning behind this is that there are only a couple spawn points for Cyndaquil to show up, but regardless, I gave it a shot to see if I could finish this off strong. Awww. No. <laughs> Part of me wants to keep going. Although I was done, I didn't feel like I was done. I decided to keep hunting until I found a Cyndaquil, but this time, I had a new plan. Although I can't change the spawns in the cave, I can still manipulate them. In the back of the cave, there are a few ledges that you can stand on, and despite the game banning you from making sandwiches on any piece of land that's a few degrees off from flat, you can set up in the back, which means you can keep respawning them. By standing on the ledge and having your Pokemon auto battle, you can basically just sit there and watch Gallade knock out everything, and with a little trial and error of resending out your Pokemon, eventually, it all works out. There it is, the real 100th shiny. With this encounter, I completed the challenge in just barely over 50 hours and caught nearly every single shiny line in the entire DLC. Wait, is, is this a wholesome ending to a Johnstone video? No silly gag? No, just us in the moment, enjoying one of the hardest and coolest shinies to get in the game. Wow. Oh. Okay.